We're very excited this morning for Jonathan to preach. Uh, so come on up. Yes. And uh, boy, we're just so glad the blessing you are in our congregation and to hear you preach. I've been excited all week, looking forward to it. I'm just going to pray and then he can take over. Thank you, Lord, for Jonathan and uh, for his calling or for your calling on his life, God. I pray that you would bless him this morning, uh, empower him with your Holy Spirit to uh, share your word with us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, good morning. Um, I guess before I get going, I'll just pray to open again. Uh, God, I just thank you for this time we've had just to worship corporately together and just... As it's been, say, it's been really good weather this past bit. We had a little bit of an early spring. I pray that, well, thank you for the blessing that is, but I also pray um, that we're able to center in for what you have for this, us this morning. And, um, you know, I just thank you, God. And I pray you just use this message that I've been working on over this week just to speak to the hearts here. But thank you, God. Amen. All right. I'll just get my notes up. Um, well, welcome to church this morning. Um, before I get into the message this uh, morning, um, as, as uh, say, Jeremy was saying, uh, Clint is away for a couple of weeks, so I'll be speaking this week, and then we have Miracle speaking the following week. Um, but before that, this, as this is my first sermon, I know there's a lot of you, say, I've been able to visit a little bit with, but some I haven't really had that opportunity yet. So before I get into the message, I wanted to just tell you a few things about myself, just so, you know, it's not just this stranger kind of up here that you don't really know much about. So to start, as I was saying, like, my name is Jonathan. I'm the youth pastor here at uh, Hillside. I started, what was it? It was back in September, so it's been about a half year so far. Um, a couple other things I guess I could tell you. Uh, this past April, I just finished my uh, degree at Summit, where I did the music leadership program over there in Abbotsford. And... Um, you have basically to give you a brief idea of this, pretty much mixed pastoral and music ministry is basically what that program is. Um, but uh, one other thing I guess I could tell you is, before I get the message, is I am the youngest of three siblings. Um, and I'm sure for anyone else who is a youngest sibling, you probably do understand that uh, there's a bit more attention maybe given to the youngest, younger sibling. I don't know if anyone else experiences that. I felt like I had almost three moms growing up, so I don't know. But anyway, um, but in saying that, um, the person I'm going to be speaking on today was also the youngest. And I'm sure many of you are already very familiar with his story, and this will be kind of just a review for you, but I, it's still important to reflect on the message and how God used his life. And today we're going to be speaking and working through the story of Joseph um, and the sovereignty of how God can be seen throughout his life, say, where he remained faithful to God and trusted God despite the circumstances facing him. And I want to, before kind of jump into the text, I want to give a bit of background. Like the story of Joseph, that is written in narrative. And like 40 about, it's about 40% of the Old Testament is all written in narrative. Like I say, there's also, say, poetry and there's the law and those different kind of books. But um, when you're looking at narrative, like some of you probably do know this, but it's important to look at the full text, not just, say, portions where you can, say, maybe in the law or when you're looking in, say, um, like Paul's letters and different things, you can just draw from certain portions. But it's important to look at the full story in order to kind of see um, how that is revealing, like how God acts and how God is working in the lives of those uh, accounted over the Old Testament. And I also believe it's important to mention um, that this story of Joseph uh, ties into the coming of Jesus, as we will see later. And it's also an important thing to keep in mind when we're looking at the Old Testament that since, say, the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden, through, say, through Noah, through Abraham, now today we're going to be looking at Joseph, the need for Jesus to redeem the world is repeatedly a theme present in these texts. Um, initially, I want to give a synopsis of the first chapter in Joseph's story, uh, just to count, just to kind of lay the setting for the rest of the message today. But this is in uh, Genesis 37. I'll kind of go through. Um, and in verse 2, like we see Joseph was still only a teenager. He's the age of 17. Like, reading that, like, I just think about, say, my youth leaders who we have here at the church where, I mean, that really deepens the meaning, like, where they're at at life. And, like, say, he's still this, just a youth, and he, 
There's so much for him to still experience and take part in. But that also adds weight to what is that happened to him later in this chapter. And as it continues, we see he speaks on how, say, he's highly favored from above all, from all his other older brothers, as he gets special treatment from his father, but this builds up a hatred against him from his, all his other brothers. And as it continues, um, Joseph has a, two prophetic dreams, which also further build this aggression against him. And at the start of, of verse 12, if you're following along in your Bibles, uh, and kind of on, onward for the remainder of this chapter, there's a point where, say, Joseph is sent uh, by his father to give a report about how his brothers are doing in the field tending the sheep. Where, interestingly, it was all his brothers and not him working out there. And, but here, say, say, Joseph is at home, like, wearing or, ornate robe uh, that was made for him by his father, where, say, his initial... Uh, co- Conversation is kind of taking place, and as Joseph later in, say, verses thir- uh, 17 and 18, like as he's making his way towards the, his brothers from the camp, um, it says, So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dotham. But when, he saw him, when they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here we, we see that this hatred had escalated, say, beyond just a civilian rivalry as their hearts had half hardened to the point where, say, his brother, their brother is no longer seen as a family member or, say, as an equal, but just an object that has captured their father's eye. Although Reuben, the oldest brother, countered this, like, and instead convinced his brothers to throw Joseph into a barren cistern, or a cistern is meaning well. Um, although, interestingly, it's not Reuben that saves Joseph's life. Rather, it is his brother Judah who sees a group of traveling merchants and convinces his brothers to sell Joseph as a slave rather than to kill him. As, you say, jo- as Reuben only delays their intent, while Judah convinces and makes the brothers all agree to sell Joseph instead. In verse 28, it continues like, So when the Midianite merchants came by, uh, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. You can think that this evil act would say would be the end of the story, but God is sovereign. God is in control. And even amidst these dark and hopeless days that were about to happen um, and were going to face Joseph, he did not give up on his faith and, and held on to that faith in the God of Abraham. Now, kind of, that's just, as this narrative has been set, the, the background for what we're going to be working through. Um, the first area I believe is important for us to focus on today is in regards to what God does amidst the circumstances facing Joseph. As we will look further, we'll see how Joseph ends up in the household of an Egyptian official who is captain of the guard named Potiphar at the beginning of Genesis 39. When verse 2 will start, The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him a success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care, in his care everything he owned from the time he put him in charge of his household, and from the time he put him in charge of his household, and, and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. Now because of Joseph, the house of Potiphar is blessed. This echoes very similar, say, to his father Jacob. Um, in the house of Laban when he's kind of working towards, um, well, he, uh, that was a bit different context because he's kind of working towards, say, getting a wife like uh, Rachel and Leah. And, but it's important to recognize in both these accounts, these echo back to the initial fulfillment of Ab- the Abrahamic promise, where Abraham say, he's the great grandfather of Joseph. But in Abraham's calling back in Genesis 12, God is saying to him, In verse 3, like, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Like, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And when we look at this account between Potiphar and Joseph, say, this blessing on the house of Potiphar is not because of Joseph's great works or abilities, but rather it is because of the sovereignty of God as he is faithful to his promises, and even in the weakness of humanity, he is strong. Although immediately following this seemingly restoration 
to the unjust actions of his brothers. Um, Jesus, I mean, sorry, sorry. Joseph faces yet another hopeless situation uh, as he, in his faithfulness to God and, and the moral strength that he has, like he's thrown to jail after a false accusation made by Potiphar's wife. Say, who after failing to alert Joseph, say, to sleeping with him over an extended period of time, she twists the narrative and brings accusations that strip Joseph of his position and the trust Potiphar once placed upon him. Like how that would have felt to have someone who once cared and trusted in you to feel that you attempted to betray them in this way. Like Joseph, a man of honor, to have that stripped away, brought lower than when he first arrived, like now a prisoner rather than just a slave. But this is also a testament to the moral strength of Joseph. To be forsaken and used by his brothers to be a piece of property and still remain faithful to God amidst all of that, and now after being seduced repeatedly by, say, say being the wife of like, an Egyptian official, she probably would have been very attractive. And here's Joseph, after, say, being broken by world, holding, the ground, holding his ground rather than for one moment taking back from the cruel hand being dealt to him. First by his brothers, and now the Egyptians. But as he's falsely accused, thrown into prison, we see that God is in control, and God is sovereign, despite what the world seemingly seemed to be speaking to him, God continued to bless others through him. And as we continue, we will see that he is entrusted by the jail keeper over all the other prisoners, as it continues. And through this, there's a point where he say he's assigned to attend a couple of Egyptian officials, say, who've been placed in the same jail as him due to their offending of Pharaoh. And just to be continuing in uh, Genesis 40, verses 1 and 4, it says, Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody of the house of the captain of the guard, in the same prison where Joseph was confirmed, confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. Over Joseph's time attending these officials, say, after a period of time had passed, like each of these officials had dreams on the same night. And Joseph, through the wisdom imparted to him by God, is able to interpret them. However, even though Joseph did this for the officials, where, say, where they understood what was about to happen, as one was restored uh, to the previous vision, the other's life was taken, he was again forgotten. It was not for two years that the cupbearer, who has been restored to his position, remembered him. But through this, we see the sovereignty of God as the narrative continues, where due to the favor granted him by the jailer, he's able to be put in charge of the two Egyptian officials. And in turn, that is what enables this opportunity to offer Pharaoh counsel, which we see in uh, chapter 41, verses 15 to 16. It says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream. There's no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said that you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. This also is a testament to the faith of Joseph, where he gives the credit immediately back to God, and he gives authority and glory back to God. After spending years in prison, which was from no wrongdoing, he himself committed, he still remains faithful, he still stands resilient to not bend to the temptation to hold the glory for himself, as he now stands before the highest power in Egypt beyond God. And he could have saved just you to the temptation, just as he could have with Potiphar's wife. But he places his trust in the sovereignty of God, above the situation, above the, his hopelessness, and he recognizes that only God holds the power to bring restoration to his current circumstance. And through this, as he interprets Pharaoh's dreams, which there are two, uh, he's not only freed, but through his counsel, uh, to Pharaoh. After these interpretations, interpretations of the dreams, Pharaoh makes him second command to him and places him over the whole of Egypt. In verse, uh, chapter 41, 39 to, uh, verses 39 to 41, it says, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning as wi and wise as you. You shall be ch in charge of my palace. And all the people are to submit to you and, and your orders. Only in respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. 
from a slave held in prison to second command over an entire nation in a day. Like God is sovereign. Say, if, I, if that's not, not enough to prove that, from being, say, from being betrayed by his brothers to now second command to Pharaoh, when we read, say, chapter 41, verse 46, it says, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered into the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That means he spent a span of 13 years. Like, like this all happened over a span of 13 years from be, being betrayed by his brothers to now being one of the highest positions in the nation. God is sovereign. Like this is important reminders for us today, as say we, as we who profess Jesus Christ as Lord over our lives, we can hold that same faith and hope that Abraham and Joseph had, that as we have say we've been drafted in the family of God by the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus on the cross, and we are able to say find that hope that in whatever season we are, we are facing, God is sovereign. In both the times of blessing and plentiful, say where there were relationships with family and friends are good, and our finances and jobs are going well, say, to the times of anxious nights and overwhelming demands and expectations placed upon us, God is sovereign. Each one of us has faced and will continue to face a continued shift of seasons that are good or bad or somewhere in between, where one moment, say, we're getting a promotion to the next, say, we're attending the ceremony of the passing of a friend. There will be times, I can say for me, like, uh, where I say I've seen friends moving on from their, so it just seemed like continually figuring it out, say getting married, getting jobs, and where there was a time, say I was kind of continually stuck in the same cycle, unable to say to learn from my mistakes, and continually feeling like I was just wanting to be just for a moment, waiting too long, I guess, just for a moment, as opportunities just kind of continue to pass me by. But God had a plan, and say when I stopped trying to figure it all out myself and just started depending on Him and looking to Him. Like that kind of led my path and directed my path, and that's how I kind of eventually ended up here, this position I have now. So in what you face today, for some, say it might be easier than others, or maybe it's more clear, but God is sovereign. And he is journeying, journeying alongside us just as he did with Joseph. And say when we face storms, or we can try to face that alone. Perhaps say it's overcoming a seizing of overwhelming busyness or needing to overcome a, an addiction. But if we are to run to the shelter of Jesus and find rest in his strength and his grace, like even when the seasons are seem hopeless or seemingly keep coming back, God is our source of strength. And as we hold on to him and hold on to our faith in him, say as Joseph did both when he was taken from his homeland and then also as he was wrongfully held in prison, our faith in God gives us the strength to overcome and they shine brightly even when the world around us is dark. Now, just in continuing to what Joseph's promotion and kind of entering into the Pharaoh's service, like as the account moves forward, there's a fulfillment to the interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams, which were, say, by God imparting this wisdom to Joseph, there were seven years of great prosperity in the land, followed by seven years of famine that would ravage the land. And after these seven years of abundance began to force as the seven years of famine kind of started, this began to force surrounding groups to come to Egypt as they heard there was food being available amidst the famine in the land. As like Jacob hears of this, and he's speaking in Genesis 42, 1 to 2, it says, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard it that there's some grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. This famine forced Joseph's brothers to make their way to Egypt in order to trade for food so that they would not perish and the clan of Jacob would not disappear. But they are said to say just to be looking at one another. Perhaps this is because of hearing, oh, I'd say, when they hear Egypt, what that reminds them of and who they sent there long ago. When these brothers arrive in Egypt, they bow down before the governor of the land, which is Joseph. However, unlike Joseph, though, they do not recognize him. And there are two tests kind of devised by Joseph initially in uh, chapter 42, verses 8 to 20. I'll read through first. Um, Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies. You've come to, to see where our land is unprotected. 
No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all but one, sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them. You've come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants are, were twelve brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, the one is no more. Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies. And this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place until your younger brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested and see if you are telling the truth. If you're not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you're honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. Like initially we see in the first part of the plan, like in order to test his brothers or say where all but one is kind of to remain behind and that one is to return with Benjamin among them. Although first, to say, they are held in prison for three days. And this kind of is, kind of makes them reflect on what, it, perhaps, their past actions. And this, the second part also furthers this, where instead of only one of the brothers, say, who would remain behind, in order, and now it's just one of the brothers, not just all of them that would remain behind, just to pay the price for the one. One would pay the price for them all. Sorry. And this brings the guilt back upon the brothers for what they had done to Joseph in the past. Where they exclaim, exclaim to one another in, say, chapter uh, 42, verses 21 to 23. They said to one another, Surely we are being punished for our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded for, with us for his life. But we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us, Reuben replied. Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must forgive accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. And through Joseph's response to this, like we can tell that he's not doing this out of malice or revenge. Like in verse 24 it says, he turned away from them and began to weep. But when, and then came back and spoke to them again, he had Simon taken and bound before their eyes. This response to the unease among his brothers was not in order to inflict suffering or punishment to them by Joseph. But as we will look further, as the brothers like, do later return with Benjamin, it was all in order to, as we will see in the later chapters, that, to redeem Jacob and his family from the famine ra ravaging the land. In their second journey with Benjamin alongside them, they this time were in, in, instead brought to Joseph's home, where we see, I'll read uh, uh, chapter 43, verses 24 to 28. The steward, steward took the men into Joseph's home, house and gave them water to wash their feet and provided fodder for their donkeys. They prepared their gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon because they had heard that they were to eat there. When Joseph came home, they presented to him the gifts they had brought into the house and they bowed down before him to the ground. He asked them how they were and he said, how is your aged father you told me about? Is he still living? They replied, Your servant, your father, is alive and well. And they bowed down, prostrating themselves before him. Again, the, their, the brothers bowed before Joseph as he came into their presence. And after the meal and the day, and the day came to a close, in the morning they were set, all sent out on their way. Although Joseph has placed one more test, as Joseph's cup has been placed into Benjamin's sack of grain. And the steward kind of, as the steward catches up to them after they depart, when he confronts them, they place a vow that unknown to them at the time would doom the life of Benjamin, saying uh, in chapter 44, verses 9 to 10, if any of you servants have found to have it, he will die. If any of your servants are found to have it, he will die, and the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. Very well then, he said. Let it be as you say, whoever is found to have it will become my slave. The rest of you will be free from blame. Which as the narrative unfolds, we see Benjamin is found to have, in his, found to have it in his sack of grain. And this leads to 
all the group to return to Joseph in a plea for mercy, as their brother Benjamin is mistakenly, in the sense, sold as a slave bound for Egypt, just as his brother Joseph before him. But by the, and this is by the actions of his brothers, although this time through the vow rather than for silver coins. The guilt of what they had done to their brother again is brought to the surface. But now the response matches that of their father back in chapter uh, 37, verse 34. As, like, as, jo J as Jacob tore his clothes at the sight of the bloody robe, that was to give the impression that his son Joseph had died. But now the brothers are the ones who are tearing their clothes, the news of what is, be is to become of Benjamin. And then this comes to re resolution in chapter 45. And in this chapter, we clearly we understand clearly that Joseph's actions were not done in order to enact revenge against his brothers, but rather in his revealing himself to his brothers, which of course brought great fear of retrib retribution that would come against them for the guilt they now vividly were feeling for, for what has been done to their brother Joseph in the past. Like in verses 4 to 11, it says, Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it is it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will, there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to persevere, preserve sorry, for you a remnant on earth and save your lives from, by a great deliverance. So then it is not by you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have, I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. It was because of God and his sovereignty that Joseph was set upon the path laid before him over the evil actions of his brothers, where through Joseph's faith and trust in God throughout his life, he, he's able to see that the evil actions of his brothers were used by God for his purpose and for his plan. And in this, we see how God, in his sovereignty, is a promise keeper. For he, he preserved the seed of Abraham and the promise that he would make his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And in this sending of Joseph ahead of Egypt, head to Egypt enabled for the seed of Abraham to survive the famine in the land. And, and this enabled for the great say, nation to form, where great kings such as David would come. And through this nation, a savior, the Lion of Judah, would also come this line of Judah being Jesus. And in his sovereignty, he kept his promise that he would make Abraham into a great nation. And in his sovereignty, he promised, he fulfilled his promises in the dreams given to Joseph as a 17-year-old where his brothers bowed low before Joseph now as he was governor over Egypt, just as God did when, uh, with the other Egyptian officials in Pharaoh's dreams. And in his sovereignty, he brought a 17-year-old boy from a place of other, utter hopelessness to a place of great power over a nation in only 13 years, from, what, from that of a lowly slave to that of a governor. And when we look at this encounter between Joseph and all his brothers, we can see how, how he tests them. And in doing so, he's able to, see, able to see that their hearts have changed from what they knew, what he knew them as when he was 17. They've not filled with anger, but rather the opposite, where now they're humbly coming before him in respect, and they are protective of their younger brother, Benjamin, rather than, say, using him for their self-gain. And we can see the sovereignty of God in this account, as God has brought Joseph to the place where, say, when he had the opportunity and power to take full revenge upon his brothers for what they did to him in the past, he instead was here that Joseph is working towards redeeming his brothers, alongside the rest of his family from the famine, just as he had done for Egypt. Like, there are times and seasons where we, like, as brothers, as the brothers that Joseph had, need to face perhaps our past sins, or deal with what has been festering from our past, or 
only coming back here and there. And there are times where we're going to need to humbly come before God as we've taken control over our lives and lost our dependence on Him. And there are times where we need to be patient also and have grace for those who have perhaps wronged us in the past. Like Joseph models this for us, just as Jesus did, do, does for and did for us on the cross as He took our shame and our sin and guilt upon Himself. And so, just as Jesus had grace for us, we need to have grace for others. There's going to be times where we have perhaps a friend, a co-worker, or even a family member that we will really push, say, our limits. And like, but can we forgive as Christ has forgiven us? Can we throw a stone when, say, we ourselves are worthy of that stone to be just thrown at us? And like thinking upon this, like, it reminds me, say, just... If you're familiar, like Edmund in the first Narnia movie, if you are familiar with that, um, when he splits off in the first half, kind of near the beginning, uh, from his siblings and turns to the white rich rather than making his way to Aslan with others. Um, in doing so, this forces his family to flee from the white witch's police who pursue them across Narnia. Which, if you've seen the movie or even read the book, like A Lion, Witch, and the Road Drop, like, you know that Edmund has a turning point where after being held prisoner by the White Witch, he's also able to see the effects of what his actions brought to others, such as Thomas, um, who is able to see directly what happens to him. And, and in, over the course of the movie, like, he changes his ways and turns. Instead of fighting for himself, he, he fights for others. And he doesn't pursue his glory, but he pursues the good of Aslan and his people. Now, we all make mistakes. Undoubtedly, none of us will go through the lengths that Joseph's brothers did. Um, against maybe a sibling or someone, and, or say we will not have anything happen to us like Joseph ha had happened to him. But our actions we do take uh, are the, s and the actions that we do take, are we the center of our lives or is God? Do we view others for our benefit or as equal in the sight of God? We each have a choice in how we respond to the seasons that will face us. Say whether that is betrayal or temptation as Joseph faced or may that seen ourselves as higher than others, as Joseph's brothers did when they used their brother Joseph in order for self-gain. And when we respond, do we trust that in what is facing us or with what path we are on, if by choice or not, God is still sovereign, the same as he was back then and will be tomorrow. And God is faithful. And even though, say, there are times we will mess up and we do not get it right, he's faithful. And he's not going to give... He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's not going to stop pursuing you. And he will never stop loving you. Like when we're weak and we want to give up, he is strong. When we're tired and we stumble, he is there to pick us back up. So in closing this morning, um, maybe I just want to invite the worship team to make their way back up. Um, I hope for today that maybe you're going to spend some time perhaps looking back at Joseph's story over this week. And, the, and even though, say, there perhaps are seasons that will not make sense right now. Our God is sovereign. And say Joseph had to wait 13 years before he was made governor over Egypt. I'm sure none of those years were easy. But in the circumstances facing you today, lean into God. Don't hide. Don't run away from him, but rather run toward him. And hold fast to your faith in him that he is there with you. And in the storms, just as the same as say he's there on the clear days. But God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this time we kind of had to just to walk through Joseph's story. Um, I think for this time we've had to see how you moved in his life and how you, ch you shaped his heart and also the, the sh hearts of his brothers. And I pray that we're able to learn from that. And if there's something each of us can draw from this, this message, as I know, like for many of us here, this is a very familiar story, but I pray that we're able to spend time, though, this week just reflecting and just understanding the heart, what our heart is and the actions we take and our heart towards others and but I thank you for this morning, God. I pray you just use this message and I pray for, of course, the community following this, um, for times we have to talk, speak with others, for times we have both at, here but also at work and whatever we're doing. Um, but thank you for this morning, God. Amen. <laughs>